In 2017, the New York Times Magazine approached me with an ambitious idea. They asked me to illustrate a story by Nathaniel Rich about how we lost a golden opportunity to prevent the worst effects of climate change some 30 years ago. But instead of documenting what happened back then, they wanted me to document the effects of our inaction that can be seen today, drawing on my experience as an aerial photographer. They wanted me to find the strongest examples of climate change on all seven continents, and they gave me about a year to do it. A grant from the Pulitzer Center helped facilitate this project as a whole. The first place I went was Greenland. When most people think of glaciers melting, they imagine big chunks of ice falling off into the sea. But the reality is quite different. In western Greenland, about 60% of the ice loss is from glaciers withering away before they ever reach the sea. In the summer, that meltwater collects in huge glacial lakes, and eventually the water finds a crack and will drain right down through the base of the glacier, 3,000 feet below. From there, it will form an underground river that lubricates the base of the glacier and speeds it on its way to the sea. I went out there by helicopter with some scientists from the National Science Foundation who are studying the flow of the glacial melt, and they put non-toxic red dye in the water to track it as it went down the Big Moulin, which is the big drain hole that carries the water down to the base of the glacier. They were trying to understand the speed and volume of the flow and how its pulses vary through the day and through the melt season. While most of my work was looking at the consequences of climate change, while I was in China, I wanted to look at a couple of the causes, as China is currently producing 15% of global greenhouse gases, much of it from coal. This is Herwusu, the largest coal mine in all of Asia. To give you an idea of scale, that coal truck is about the size of a three-story house. China consumes about half the coal in the world, and it supplies about 50% of the national demand for electricity. Most of the pictures I took in this project were done with the drone. It's very difficult to get permission to photograph inside a mine like that, but with the drone, you don't really need permission. This is one of the coal sorting yards outside the largest power plant in China. It supplies about a third of the energy for Beijing, and they have a coal sorting yard where they take all the coal from different mines before it goes into the power plant. Those little blue buildings are what they drive the trucks into so they can sort it out by different grades. And the green cloth? Well, it had been raining that morning, and they were trying to keep the coal dry. China has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. The growth of energy use there is staggering, especially in the big cities, like Shanghai. As people earn more money, they have more devices that require electricity, and they buy more cars. In China, they still have a small fraction of the energy use that we have here in the United States on a per capita basis. But the rate of increase there is extraordinary, and they have a lot more people. In China, they also have a shortage of fresh water. The biggest freshwater lake, Lake Taihu, is now mired every summer with algal blooms. The algae are flourishing from a combination of warming water from climate change with fertilizer from agricultural runoff. Here, the algae clogs a fish trap near the lake shore. This is an aerial view of the main ferry terminal in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. As climate change accelerates, the city is getting flooded almost every year. The riverbank is raised like a levee, but with increasingly intense summer monsoons, the city can't drain fast enough, and the streets flood like on the inside of a shallow bathtub. The monsoons are getting more intense as warming water in the Bay of Bengal releases more moisture, which results in more rainfall throughout the low-lying country. Here it's flooding up fish farms and rice paddies. Upriver, the Brahmaputra Delta floods almost every year, and for the people who live on the islands, flooding has become an almost annual occurrence. Now it's becoming routine to abandon their homes to flooding and come back and clean the mud out and plant their crops again. This is the last island on the seaward edge of the Brahmaputra Delta. The green you see in the background, those are rice paddies, and at high tide they're only inches above sea level. If they get any kind of storm surge, their one staple crop of the year is a total loss, and they are destitute. This picture was taken at the ferry terminal, and they're walking on the dock that is totally underwater to take a boat back to the mainland. The people in the Delta have adapted to living very lightly in the land, and so when they want to get from one part of the island to another, they have to take a very rickety bamboo bridge. When you know you're going to get flooded every year, your infrastructure becomes temporary. I spent three weeks in a sailboat to shoot Antarctica as I wanted to visit a penguin colony there. The chinstrap penguin populations are declining due to loss of their principal food, which is krill. 
Krill are small shrimp-sized crustaceans that live off algae that grows in the bottom of the sea ice. With warming water, there's less sea ice, and therefore less algae and less krill. We were one of the first boats down there in the spring, and the sea ice was already disappearing. This is the shore of Deception Island, where the penguin colony is a small fraction of what it once was. Here, the mating pairs take turns going to the sea to hunt for krill, but with warming conditions, the penguin population has declined about 40% over the past 15 years. You also find severe effects of climate change in West Africa. This is Chingeti, an ancient town on the edge of the Sahara in Mauritania. It was a caravan stop for the salt trade many centuries ago, but it's slowly becoming buried in sand as desertification and increasingly intense sandstorms fill its streets with sand. I talked to the chief of the village, and he said that almost a meter of sand has been blown in over the past decade, and the weight of it is knocking down the walls of the village. This is Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania, where a brand new road in the outer suburbs is quickly getting buried by windblown sand. When Nouakchott was established in 1962, there were only about two dozen people living there. Now there are over a million, many of them climate refugees, without basic utilities. If you look in the lower left part, you can see the water truck that can no longer pass through the sand-filled streets. Last year was actually a pretty good year for the Great Barrier Reef, but on the other side of the continent, the seagrass was not so lucky. This is on the southwest coast of Australia, in Shark Bay, where I went out with some scientists who were trying to figure out how to re-establish seagrass, which has been dying off due to increasing water temperatures. And this is in the Gadmen part of the Swiss Alps. They estimate by the end of this century, there will be almost no permanent ice left in the Swiss Alps. 20 years ago, you could walk across the Trift Glacier to get from one side of the valley to the other. But now the glacier is retreated so far up the valley that they had to build the longest footbridge in Switzerland to get across what's now a lake. I was in Africa when Hurricane Harvey struck and got on the next plane back to the States. I was lucky to be in the first civilian helicopter that was led into Houston after the rain stopped. Many parts of the city were totally paralyzed. They had about a year's worth of rainfall in four days from Hurricane Harvey. With increasing water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, more intense rainstorms are expected. This is Beaumont, Texas, where they had 18 inches of rain in 18 hours. I always thought of floods as being like big walls of muddy water coming in, but here it was like somebody just left the shower on for 18 hours straight, and there was just nowhere for the water to go. This is in the Coffee Park section of Napa, California, where wildfires related to climate change have wiped out entire suburban communities. The prolonged drought in California created a lot of dead tree branches. When severe winds knocked the tree branches into power lines, they fell onto dry grass and created what was the most destructive fire in California history, until another even more destructive fire hit last fall. One of the things about working with a drone is you're actually there on the ground. And as I walked through Coffee Park, the spookiest thing I saw were the vehicles that had been left behind by homeowners escaping the blaze. On many of them, you could see pools of molten aluminum from the tire hubs flowing down the street like candle wax. It was one thing to see the effects of climate change in faraway lands, but as a native Californian, it was a lot more relatable on my home turf. If we all don't start making some changes, I wonder what kind of world my own children will inherit.